everybody. I'm going to talk a bit about Nginx as a high performance reverse proxies. Uh, proxy, uh, some of the, the things we ran into, some optimization. Um, my name is, if this wants to work. Hmm. Ah, there we go. Uh, Ms. Wolfart, um, we run a company called Quant, um, we're one of the sponsors, and our product GoodX is used by doctors for their billing and their clinical notes, which is a web-based application. And then on top of that, we also have a medical aid switch, um, which basically gets your claim from the intercare or wherever you are to the discovery who needs to pay the intercare, and that is a HTTP-based um, service that we run, well, a, a RESTful service um, that obviously uses a reverse proxy as well. Um, so, sure, this is, uh, what is a Nginx? Um, Nginx is a high performance uh, web server. Um, web servers, um, as you know, is, this is really slightly annoying, um, web servers, uh, Apache, IIS, and a couple of others, um, often will run your software for you through some kind of a CGI interface or it will reverse proxy and they can be real annoying buggers. If any of you have ever used Apache, maybe I just have a personal um, hate for it, but the fact that it, they decided to up and change their, their config format in the middle of, a, of an upgrade and caused a SSL issue for me um, actually pushed me into using Nginx which I did not understand and then I got all this massive performance and from there, I basically never ever went back to anything else. So, typical reverse proxy, you've got your clients connecting through your firewall into your reverse proxy, which is an HTTP server, with one or many application servers behind it. Yes? Just some clarification, are you talking about the open source one or are you talking about Nginx Plus? I'm talking about the open source one. Um, I've never used Plus. Uh, so the question was, um, am, I using, uh, am I talking about Nginx Plus or Nginx? We use only open source stacks, uh, the, we, our entire stack is open source. Um, so yeah, uh, no plus, uh, I don't have the, th I think it's three grand dollar, um, so you know, 10, 20, 30 grand a year, that's not gonna <laughs> work for, for my budget. Um, okay, so this is the typical setup and you can obviously make this a little bit more complex with um, multiple servers and, and DNS round robin, robining, but th th that's the essence of it. Okay, so what do you do with a reverse proxy? So first off, um, you handle your subdomain routing. We do a lot of that. We have got a, a domain and then every doctor gets his own little intercare.goodx or, or pity.goodx or drsmith.goodx or whatever. Uh, we also do all our SSL handling um, because if you've ever set up something like Django or uh, Cherry Pie to handle SSL, it is not a pleasant experience, it's not a quick experience, it's, it's maybe Django's better these days, but when last I worked with it, it wasn't a fun experience, and it performed like a dog. Um, whereas um, both Apache and, and Nginx will happily offload that, put it in a central place, you can load one little nice wildcard certificate and everything is happy. You can do a lot of caching in there, that'll, that'll obviously increase your, your speed, if it's possible, depending on your, your application. And a lot of what I'll say today is, uh, depends on what your use case is. Um, I'll try and answer it as good as, uh, any questions as good as I can, but I'm by no means an expert, this is a little side bit. Um, any case, uh, you, it, it'll support newer um, protocols, um, HTTP 1.1, not new, but there are still servers that don't even support that. And then things like HTTP2, um, and it'll handle the little things like your, your um, uh, if you've got multiple apps uh, that live in different uh, uh, paths on your, on your application, you can have one subdomain and make it look like there's one application, but in, in reality there's a couple of things running behind it. Um, you can do your load balancing, um, so if you've got multiple servers, you can load balance across that, and obviously that'll um, result, or if it's set up correctly, will give you some high availability. Um, and the actual core web server often outperforms uh, uh, the, the built-in um, whatever you're using, PHP, Cherry Pie, I, I don't even know um, most of them, but it'll often outperform uh, the servers. Um, so why is Nginx fast? Uh, why is it faster than uh, your run-of-the-mill Apache? It's because they use an event-driven architecture. They don't have a thread and or process per connection. They've got one thread that serves with a select or an epoch loop, select um, and, and manage many sockets in one server. Um, it's effectively 
what in the old days of Windows 3.1 was called um, cooperative multitasking, where one system would hand over to another one, um, but in this case you're working with the kernel, and most of the work of knowing when to service a, a TCP socket that carries the HTTP data um, boils down to uh, the kernel, and the kernel is quite good at this. It knows when and where data is, and there's no scheduling of threads effectively waiting for a, a read from a socket to return. Um, as such, uh, the, the thread will handle, handle multiple events. Um, it'll, it'll use uh, ePoll specifically in Linux. I don't know what it does, if it even runs on Windows. Um, but there, there are multiple options there. And then, um, obviously, they have a modular design, which is a, a nice thing to do plugins on. Um, now getting to this thing. The basic setup um, would be something like this, where you've got your SSL, either IPv4 or v6. You'll have, likely have a certificate, which I don't have. I've got the subnomain.example forwarding into localhost or 3000 on HTTP. And our event, uh, in our case, this thing is either a um, AIO HTTP server or it would be a Cherry Pie server, which is a lightweight little Python server. Um, but really, this can be anything. This could even be an HTTPS hosted server likely wouldn't make sense to, to do that internally, but if you do this across the open internet, that might actually make sense. And if you want to load balance, you have created a quick group, um, you've got least connections, you've got hash, round robin, I think plus has um, the quickest, or the, the, the one with the lowest average response time, um, but for us, we just use least connection or hash, depending um, if we actually have multiple IPs. What you need to take care of with hash is if, if everything comes from one IP, they will all go to the same server. Basically, they hash the, the IP address and just keep sending it there. What you do get with hashing that is quite nice is you get stickiness. So if you've got multiple servers in the back end and your login mechanism or your, your, your sessions don't live in the database or in some external mem cache, but per server, um, you would want to use something like hash, or there are ways of setting up stickiness to root to the right, the right one. Um, and then on the inside, we just have the same little listen and proxy pass to that, and it'll magically round robin. It is a, it's a well, and all, least connect. Um, so if we get to optimizing, uh, by the way, I tend to jump around a lot, so if anything's unclear or if I open a thread and then open another thread, just stop me um, if you've got questions, but I'm going to rush through, through this, leave some questions, and then we can go eat. So, um, You want to set your worker processes to be around your CPU cores um, or less. It doesn't help much going to more than that. You want to set your worker connections higher. There is no sense in having it at 512. Um, we run about 10,000 per, per CPU, and we get 10, we've got 10 CPUs servicing the, the Nginx, and we easily go up to, to 10, 20,000 20, connections, no problem. Um, we seldom go above 50,000. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a second with uh, MFRL ports and and the joys of that. And then the other important thing in the actual Nginx file to remember is to have your no file limit raised. Um, that will um, help. That's effectively your file descriptor limit, um, which often defaults to 1024. Um, now, if we get to that fun little bit, and um, this is really annoying. Um, how do I do? Next slide, OK. Um, so, um, file descriptors at 102.4 in 2018, uh, you, can't, you can't think that will be the case, but even if your OS has a higher file descriptor limit, it might be the case that the user has a limit. Um, so the, these are weird things, um, like, you know, any, any machine can these days run more. I mean, I, I think the last machine that, uh, that had to have a file descriptor that I owned was a 386 or a, or a 28680. Um, I don't know why people don't change this, um, but I, I can just see someone at this discussion on what should we pick, and like, ah, oh, we'll pick 1024, no one will you know, ever need that, and yeah, fun. Um, so when you're in the reverse proxy um, situation, every socket that connects in, every TCP connection is a file descriptor, and every connection going out to the back end is another file descriptor, so you're wasting two, and then there's sometimes a, a little bit extra um, if you're doing caching and things like that, where they'll also be file descriptors. So, so you, you burn a lot of file descriptors, and um, I've had the, the pleasure of fighting with, with unavailable TCP sockets, um, and we'll get there in a second. But basically, in your system, you go into your sys.fs.filemax, and you 
up that and then in your um, securitylimits.conf you can per user set that um, and then in your nginx and your file limit will not exist anymore. Okay, then um, if you've got a large amount of incoming connections and from time to time you get some delay, having a, a bit of a backlog um, can be handy. This depends again on your use case. Um, in some cases this can actually be detrimental, but for us um, that works a charm because we've got a lot of transactions coming in and if they have to queue up a second and you've got 50,000 coming in in a second and something queues up your server a bit, you can queue up a, a, couple, of, a couple of 10k um, and basically you've got, to, you've got to tell your kernel, um, you set the surmaxcon field, you've got to tell the netdev max backlog and nginx back, the backlog field in nginx in the main listen directive and it'll happily go uh, to more. Then, ephemeral ports. That is the fun thing that they put into the system, they designed it to TCP to make your system randomly break um, and cause you horrible nightmares um, it, it took us a couple of outages to, to finally find what was going on because we, we could never actually get to the system in time. Um, it would just be offline for a minute. And now a minute doesn't sound like a lot, but at the same time if you're doing transactions and people are pushing transactions into to medical aids and they want money, they don't feel friendly when the system's offline. So, um, basically what happens is you make a TCP connection, there's the whole uh, syn synac hack, um, and now you keep going and there's the occasional packet. When you shut this down, the kernel keeps effect effectively that port occupied for a couple of seconds, 30 seconds, I think it's the default, or 60, um, to just check whether there's any straight out of order packets that came in at, at a later time and to discard them and not cause chaos in your system. The problem is if you've got a, a system making short-lived connections, like say 10,000 a second or, or, or 50,000 a minute or whatever, um, you, get an, uh, you get this 30 second that each TCP port gets not cleaned up. You very quickly get to a point where you've used all your TCP ports and your system just seems to not, you can't connect to it. Um, uh, finally, we found it and it's a fairly f uh, quick fix. You set a TCP timeout. Uh, the, the timeout, time wait there at the bottom, you set that to one second or five seconds or shorter. Um, the other thing you can do is you can increase your default range. I think it's 30, about 30,000 to, to 65,000 and you can usually broaden that a bit. Um, 2,000 might be a bit, bit of a low number, but, but you can. Um, then um, performance wise, keep alive connections is something to, to take care of. You can actually uh, it depends a lot on, on, on what you're doing, but if you've if you've got multiple if you've got many clients and they they can abuse your system, it it can actually slightly slow down each individual one and save a lot of ports by just limiting the amount of connections their browsers allow to keep open. I think Chrome these days will will open I think uh, five, but I, I might be mistaken on that. Um, and there are systems that will open more and just use up your TCP connections for no apparent reason. If your system, however, has your JavaScript, has the, the nice feature that it fetches many small little things, you might want to set this higher to allow latency to be a bit lower. So this really depends on your setup. Um, so again, understand what you're doing. On the upstream side, you've got a similar situation. Um, typically, you, if you're on a local network and you don't have a lot of latency, don't set this too high because there's not that big of a cost to set up connections. And you do have a bit of a cost um, detecting offline servers when you've got a lot of these uh, connections open. Um, but if you're going over the open internet and load balancing between data centers, this might actually be uh, uh, something you might want to do to reduce latency between your load balancer and your backend servers. Then um, GZIP, typically a good idea. Uh, but it depends. If you don't have CPU, you don't want to do that. If you've got a lot of, lot of already um, compressed content, JPEGs, PNGs, uh, whatnot, uh, obviously don't compress that. You won't gain anything and you'll be spending CPU cycles. Unless your CPU needs exercise. I mean, that might be just to keep it fit. Um, who knows? Um, then caching, never use it. It will make your CPU lazy. Um, and, and so uh, caching, use as much as you can. Um, if, obviously it depends on your software, but if there's any static content, cache it. Caching is quick, caching is a quick, easy win. It is the way to go. Um, and in, in, in Nginx to switch it on, um, that's the base command, but there's a whole host of what you can do with caching and you can set it up into zones and things. It's all good fun that I 
don't use because I'm a terrible person um, and I feel bad for that. Um, on security, we do use a lot of security. All our connections are exclusively SSL and we have a lot of different people connecting in and it's short-lived connections. So um, we do this um, and it, it has given us a, a quite a substantial gain um, or lowered the, the, the CPU on the, on the system and actually taken some latency off the system. Um, it's very expensive, especially in negotiation, the initial connection connection and negotiation of um, an SSL. Um, so cache them. Uh, this is uh, 180 minutes and 20 megs, which is 80,000 sessions. We don't actually run that much. Um, this is just an example I copied. But I mean, you will know um, what your system requires and, and, um, and uh, yeah. Disable slower ciphers. There's good blogs on that. Just Google it um, if you want to, if you've got a performance. Issue. Yes. Sorry, you're not being that bad. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, we actually get into that point. There are still a couple of, of um, browsers that don't support anything higher. Um, I don't know if one of the makers of those browsers are at this conference. Um, but um, we don't actually support uh, any, we, we only support one browser because our software is really actually bound to, to Chrome, unfortunately. We could probably make it work on Firefox. I would never work for, for what we do. But we do have a very old Delphi 6 um, mechanism that connect in where TLS version 1 is the only thing um, that, that works. Um, so unfortunately we're stuck at that, but yeah, typically try and go for the higher ciphers, um, that way you support the NSA getting their nice little elliptic curve um, approved as the default so they can spy on you and no one else. It's nice. Um, then at least HTTP 1.1, I don't know why I'm even mentioning it, um, and then if you can, HTTP 2, the protocol's got all kinds of niceties in it, opening multiple um, concurrent connections on one, on one TCP socket effectively, um, binary headers, um, compressed, a bit better compression, just, just better. Um, you can actually talk back from the server to the client, which typically if you're using a reverse proxy might not work because your server likely doesn't support HTTP 2, but still, get ready for it. So. Then um, rate limiting. Um, if you do have users that can abuse your system, um, it is a mechanism that we've used where you've got a uh, intercare hitting you from a single IP, and they've got you know 36 different uh, entities, or it's now 40 or whatever, and they hit you with these thousands of connections on their nice little fiber. Um, being able to limit them and effectively just have some mechanism to rate limit per IP has made a big difference in our lives, um, really. Um, this I/O typically not an issue. It's going to be used for caching and logging. Again, depends on your use case. Um, you can switch logging off. Um, and if you do a lot of connections, act the the, um, or the access log I think um, can get heavy. So that might be something to switch off. And then um, socket sharding. Um, I kind of view it as this the equivalent of the polling where you let the the kernel do the work um, in the good old days. Uh, you would have one thread that takes all the connections and hands them off, off to other threads. Um, and now, and this is since I last worked with sockets at a, at a, at a lower level, at a C level, um, you can actually have multiple threads listen on the same socket, and the, it seems, and um, well, Nginx does it, I'm assuming the, the mechanisms in the kernel that do it, but um, it'll round robin between the different processes um, and all threads, and um, yeah. Uh, send file. Uh, because copying is great. If you want to exercise your DMA engine, don't switch this on. If you feel that copying data around in your memory is a senseless act, then you can set this up. Um, this will basically just move the data, keep it in kernel space and just move it inside kernel space. And then, um, yeah, know your requirements, know your system. Um, Nginx runs most of the big websites. I th uh, think of the 100 biggest websites, 100K biggest websites, more than 50%. Um, between Nginx and Nginx Plus, so it is a, a it scales well, um, and uh, yeah, questions? Come, there has to be one. Oh, so it's interesting. It's interesting. Sorry, it's interesting that you mentioned send file. Um, it's one of those things that I think it reads directly from the disk and pipes it out to the socket. Uh, you wouldn't happen to know how that deals with encryption and all of that, how that plays with. Hmm, that is actually a very good point. I don't actually know how they deal with encryption because it won't be possible to just send the raw data out, would it? Um, unless, I don't actually know. That's a good question. Um, 
Yeah, because you're obviously having a, a HTTP connection on the one side that's clear text, and on the other side you want to, unless that happens in the kernel, um, I don't know if Nginx uses the kernel's encryption, I don't, oh, there's AES modules, but I have no idea whether they do this in user space or kernel space. Again, I don't actually deal all this much with it, um, we just happen to have this nice experience with um, MFRL ports, um, and um, uh, at one of the Postgres meetups we had a discussion about it, and I thought I'd share my my joys of, of fighting with the unavailability of TCP connections um, or ports. Um, and uh, yeah, questions? More? Food? Okay, cool. Let's go eat. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, guys, sorry, I'm just